This talk is intended to sort of be a review, uh, a management of the high-grade T1 bladder cancer. I'm going to present data that uh, is out there, and I'll occasionally give you sort of my opinion for whatever that's worth. You can take it or leave it. Um, some of the things of sort of what I do. Um, anyway, we'll move on. This talk also I want to sort of dedicate to Harry Herr. And uh, as a fellow, uh, you know, I, I certainly didn't appreciate it at the time. But Harry, you know, uh, Harry was interesting. Oftentimes when we were doing a cystectomy, he would really let us go on our own. He would turn it over to maybe two fellows. And that was not the case with the TUR. He was always present with us doing the TUR and making sure we knew how to do a good TUR. And I think you're going to see that theme throughout this talk. I'm going to talk about the value of a TUR, the value of a re-resection. And as, as my career has, has gone on, I have really come to uh, appreciate how important that is. So a little bit about high-grade T1. I think it's just important to remember that this is an invasive tumor. This is not a non-invasive tumor. It invades only the lamina propria, but it is a, it is a muscle invasive, or it is a uh, invasive tumor. And up to 25% of tumors at the time of diagnosis may be up to 20, uh, T1. Um, on, when, when we looked at the TCGA data, these tumors cluster more, more closely with the T2 tumors than they do with the rest of the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer particularly those uh, TA, high-grade TA tumors. So it's just important to remember that these tumors are probably not as like the high-grade TA tumors um, or even CIS for that matter. Um, they're much more uh, similar to T2 tumors. Um, you know, previously the reports were that they had five-year progression rates of approximately 20 to 40 percent, but this recent review of a, a bunch of different published studies suggests that that's actually probably lower on the order of about 6 to 31 percent. And I'll talk about why I think that is a little bit later on. But recurrence rates remain very high. And again, we know this is a dangerous tumor. Um, and again, uh, some of the reasons are patients are treated with BCG. They weren't always necessarily in, the, in some of the previous studies. The value of re-resection and enhanced cystoscopy. So what do the guidelines say? Well, if we look at the AUA guidelines for high-grade T1, the standard is a repeat TUR if no muscle is in, this, is, uh, in the present <coughs> in the specimen. The, the recommendation is that even if there is muscle in the specimen, you should go back and re-resect. And interestingly, and I'll show another slide later on, um, that, that's just been recently reviewed as a, for an update of the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer guidelines. And although there was one study questioning the value of a, a TUR, this is going to stand. The vast majority of studies suggest even if there's not muscle in the specimen, if you're not going on to cystectomy, you should re-resect. That is very important. Um, the recommendation then would be BCG, uh, followed by maintenance BCG. We'll talk a little bit about maintenance BCG and the importance of how long that should be. Um, of course, the option is for cystectomy. We'll talk about maybe some of the patients that are better suited towards that. Um, and then if they don't uh, uh, respond to BCG, then consider cystectomy strongly. Um, the guidelines from the, uh, here's the, the schema from the AUA guidelines, just showing what I just showed you. The EAU guidelines are very similar. They do define this highest risk tumor, which we don't really have in the AUA guidelines. And again, if you look at that one, it does suggest that cystectomy should be considered early right here. Um, the NCCN, again, uh, very similar. Um, and again, uh, strongly recommend repeat TURBT. So how do we define what is this very highest risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer or T1 tumor? Well, Solid tumors uh, uh, versus papillary tumors, those that are larger, if they have a variant histology. And I think this is an area that we really still don't understand. Um, there are reports that micropapillary responds to BCG. There are reports that it doesn't respond to BCG. There are reports that it responds to chemo. There are reports that it doesn't. I really don't think we know. What I can say is I would tend to err on a more aggressive approach to a variant histology since we don't know the answer for sure. Now clearly, that's going to take into patient factors. If you have a really sick patient, I might be more willing uh, to try a BCG. But I think a young patient with a variant histology, high-grade T1 tumor, you ought to really be strongly considering cystectomy. Um, concomitant CIS. Those are really tough patients. So if they have high-grade T1 with CIS in the bladder, those patients tend not to do very well. And some other things that we know about lymphovascular invasion, hopefully your pathologists are giving you that on your TUR specimen. So those patients who have LVI associated with high-grade T1 have a higher rate of progression, and it's really important 
to uh, consider early cystectomy in those patients. Prostatic urethral involvement also. Uh, again, it's hard to stage in this area and it's been, it sort of falls in that classification of highest risk tumors. Um, T1 substratification. So I don't know how many of your all's pathologists, I, I'm guessing that Trinity's probably can, but my pathologist cannot do this. Um, although there, this has been associated with uh, a predictive value, and this was championed um, from Dr. Chang at uh, Indiana University, substratifying the depth of invasion, the vast majority of time due, uh, due to orientation, cautery artifact, and other things, I usually can't get this. But if you can, this can be predictive in terms of how likely they are to progress. This is one that's been proposed that I think is a little bit easier. This is uh, from a European study from Van Rijn that says that you can look at either microinvasion, so they just have a small amount of invasion of the lamina propria, or they could have extensive invasion. And those patients that had extensive invasion into the lamina propria had much higher chances of progression and worse outcomes than those with just microinvasion. So those are some uh, other ways of stratifying. Um, again, I don't think this is widely used in clinical practice. Even at my own institution, I find that this, uh, getting this information from the pathologist is very challenging. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this does predict uh, progression and does predict uh, disease-specific survival. So again, maybe we'll see this uh, incorporated into pathology reports a little bit further as we go on. What about risk calculators? So there are a number of risk calculators, and I'm just showing you two of these. These, these are the EORTC. This is downloadable uh, on your smart device, and the Quato. The difference between these two is that the Quato took into account using BCG, whereas the EORTC did not. There's also an SU-01, there's also an NCCN1. For the purpose of time, I didn't show all of those. But these can be helpful, I think, in uh, predicting the risk of progression in those who probably should go on to early cystectomy. Um, this was a recent uh, SEER database study that looked at developing a nomogram, a little bit more uh, maybe user-friendly uh, for some people that are used to using nomograms, and again, uh, trying to predict uh, those patients who uh, go on to progress and survival. And this is available as well as a tool to help you predict progression. This is, I think, where we're headed. And Trinity mentioned this a little bit as we started to talk about uh, sequencing of our tumors. Um, the challenge, again, remains, you know, sequencing is not widely available. It's not uh, always uh, something easy to do. It's expensive. Oftentimes, you can't get this paid for. But when we're able to sequence tumors, we are able to class tumors together, particularly for T1 tumors that cluster in this high-risk luminal type. Those are uh, tumors that appear to not respond to BCG and have a higher rate of progression. So in the future, as I think we get more uh, sequencing available, I think this is where we'll move. We'll be able to see those high-grade T1 tumors that are less likely to respond to BCG or more likely to progress, and those are people that will probably take on to early cystectomy. All right, well, what about the value of a re-resection? So this is old data, but data that's really stood the test of time, which is looking at the value of a re-resection. And when Harry did this study and looked, the greatest predictor of whether or not a patient was going to progress was the restaging TUR. So you take them back, you re-resect, they have no disease, those patients do very well, versus those patients who still have T1 on a re-resection. Now, this of course is a little bit challenging, right? So if you didn't do that first resection, you really have no idea about the completeness of that resection. And you know, Trinity talked a little bit yesterday about taking all patients back for re-resection kind of regardless of what uh, the, their planned treatment is, even if they're going on to cystectomy. And I think there is a lot of value that you can gain from doing your own resection. I don't always do that. Time and, and, and travel and other things sometimes preclude that. But I think whether that's a bimanual examination or just seeing the uh, uh, extent of the tumor can be important. If you're going to bladder spare in a T1, though, again, I think there's significant value to re-resection. Um, again, if you do find residual disease on a re-resection, assuming it was an initial resection, uh, this is another study just uh, suggesting that outcomes are significantly worse. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, the value of re-resection has been called into question, and there was one study that came out of Europe that said there really was no additional value or no improvement in progression rates or survival uh, if patients underwent a re-TUR if there was muscle in the initial specimen. 
But again, two other studies that were recent, including a randomized controlled trial, suggest that that is not true, that there is a benefit. So again, I, I want to clear up that confusion, and we're going to do that in the next iteration of the guidelines, because as we've done our literature review, it does appear re-resection does hold its value, and there is value in doing that re-resection. Okay, enhanced cystoscopy. Um, I have no ties to blue light uh, or photocure. Uh, I don't have any uh, financial ties to them at all. But I think this is an unbelievably imp uh, impressive improvement in what we've been doing. And these pictures that I'm showing you are from my cases. So these are not stock photos. These are piece of, uh, uh, pictures from my case. And this is, here you can actually see the tumor, but it's pretty hard to see. But you certainly can have a trouble seeing some of these other ones. And this was a high-grade T1 tumor. And this was a patient who had been uh, sent to me for a potential high-grade T1 tumor. I took her back. Clearly, she still had tumor. There's no way you're going to give this patient BCG and expect that that's going to go away. So I find that um, when I go back to do these re-resections, that the use of uh, enhanced cystoscopy is very, very useful. Well, what about MBI? Because a lot of people ask me about narrowband imaging. I haven't personally utilized a lot of that. Um, the trials would suggest that it also de it, uh, decreases recurrences. It really hasn't had any effect on progression. We'll talk about what enhanced cystoscopy has on that. Um, you know, there's no head-to-head -head trials, but some of the trials that have tried to compare them suggest that blue light might be uh, uh, superior, but again, we just really don't know. If you look at the guidelines, our guidelines say you should offer it if it's available. The EAU guidelines were a little less uh, um, uh, definitive. They say, you know, for a positive cytology but negative cysto, you can use, utilize it. Um, and I already talked about the value of a re-resection, and I do think that this is very, very useful. Again, this is just another one uh, of my patients here. Again, showing hard to see. You light up. It gives you the ability to resect these. I will also tell you my sort of one of my biases um, when Trinity showed some of the data. I think we should be very, very careful about using Pembro or any of the other uh, um, immunotherapy agents. I think some of the improvement that we have seen perhaps might be due to just better resections. Higher utilization of blue light, more resections by urologic oncologists. I'm not sure where we are with the immunotherapies. As Trinity mentioned, the atezolizumab trial was negative. I think we need to be very careful with Pembro. I would say if it's not a surgical candidate, fine. If it is, I think cystectomy is probably still the right answer. Um, so I talked about BCG. BCG should be given once a week for six weeks, and then it is very important in these high-risk tumors to try to get three years of maintenance in. Um, that's really been supported by the data. However, we all know this is a significant challenge with the BCG shortage. So what we've kind of tried to do is really focus on those highest risk patients and make sure that those are the patients that we're trying to give the maintenance to. We're getting away from getting longer maintenance, particularly in the intermediate. It has no role, particularly right now, in low risk tumors and you should not be giving it. Um, what about reduction or shortening? This is controversial, we don't know, but I think most of the data would suggest that if you shorten or reduce dose, you're gonna get in trouble, it's not as effective. Um, in terms of follow-up, uh, I won't go over this too much because I think everybody knows, but I just want to make a point. It is important that you're getting uh, CT scans for upper tract imaging once a year, at least for the first two years. Markers. So markers are also a sort of controversial area, um, and the EAU recommends only cytology and not. The AUA guidelines recommend cytology and then considering Eurovision. Again, I have no ties to fish. But the data is best for fish that if you give BCG and then get a cytology in fish and that fish is positive, that they are likely to uh, relapse. And so uh, that first fish can be predictive of how they're going to do. And that's where I'll use fish. Or to adjudicate, hopefully your pathologists are not reading those atypical or suspicious. But if they do, you can utilize it in that uh, instance as well. And that's supported by the guidelines. Um, T1 that does not respond to BCG is a very dangerous tumor. They have high rates of progression. And we know that patients who have a significant delay when they progress, so you're treating a high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, treating, 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 and then they progress, they have a worse outcome than if they had a de novo T2 tumor right off the bat. 
I'm not going to show the data, but the data also suggests that if those patients progress to T2 and you treat them with chemotherapy, they have a worse response to chemotherapy than the de novo T2s. So allowing those tumors to progress seems to be a very bad thing and associated with worse survival. Uh, I won't uh, go over this too much because um, uh, Trinity already covered that Pembroke can be utilized in this. There are some BCG alternatives out there. Um, these haven't been incredibly well studied, and I agree with uh, Trinity that essentially all intravesical chemotherapies are inferior to um, uh, BCG, so BCG is really what we should be using. But if you're really salvaging or you don't have BCG, these could, this could be an acceptable alternative. Um, when I was in Italy and I was speaking, it was very interesting. I think in the United States, there is a huge push to get away from mitomycin C. I do not give it in my practice anymore. I will not give patients mitomycin C. I give gemcitabine, and that's particularly true for the low-risk things based on the SWOG trial. I just seen too many bad things happen with mitomycin, and so uh, the efficacy to me seems pretty good with gemcitabine, and I've gotten away from mitomycin C. Um, outcomes with cystectomy are excellent, so if you take a T1 and they end up being a pathologic T1, they do very, very well. And again, I think that's why this push to actually undergo these early cystectomies is that if you do that, these patients do extremely well. Uh, I won't go over this in the sake of time, but there are a number of trials looking at different options, um, and Trinity covered some of those. And of course, um, one of the more intriguing ones, I think, is sort of this combination of radiation and uh, immunotherapy for T1 tumors, so we'll see where that leads. So conclusion, if you're gonna about bladder spare, if you're not gonna take out a bladder for T1, I think you should do a re-resection. I think that's supported by the data, and it's really, really critical. If you have enhanced cystoscopy, I think you should do that. I think it is helpful in re-resection, um, and so I, I recommend that. Um, if a patient shows persistent disease after BCG for a T1, I think you really strongly need to consider cystectomy in that patient. And then uh, BCG plus maintenance is critical in these people. Thank you.